In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to find an LU factorization of a matrix. First, what's an LU factoriza factorization? That means we're going to be writing a matrix A as a product of two matrices, L and U, where L is a lower triangular matrix and U is an upper triangular matrix. As a quick example, consider the 2 by 2 matrix 1, 2, 1, 0. Here's one possible LU factorization. The L is the lower triangular matrix, 1, 0, 1, 1. And the U is the upper triangular matrix, 1, 2, 0, minus 2. The lower triangular matrix has zeros above the diagonal, and the upper triangular matrix has zeros below the diagonal. LU factorizations are not unique, so it's possible that you can find another way to write the matrix A as a product of two matrices that are lower and upper triangular, uh, but this is one such factorization. And by multiplying these matrices together, you see that you get 1, 2, 1, 0, which is our matrix A. To find an LU factorization of a matrix A is a two-step process. In the first step, we're going to be doing Gaussian elimination, keeping track of each step that we do with elementary matrices until we've produced an upper triangular matrix. That will give us U. In the second step, we're going to be using the inverses of those elementary matrices to assemble the lower triangular matrix L. So let's now do that for this little example A. The first step is to do Gaussian elimination, keeping track of the elementary matrices. So our matrix here is 1, 2, 1, 0. And the row operation that I'm going to perform is minus row 1 plus row 2 into row 2. As I do this row operation, the first row is unchanged and the second row becomes 0 and then minus 2. It only took one row operation to produce something that's upper triangular. So this becomes my matrix U. And the row operation that I performed, minus row 1 plus row 2, is encoded by a specific elementary matrix. That specific elementary matrix has a 1, 0 in the first row, because nothing happened to the first row, and then a minus 1, 1 in the second row, which encodes the linear combination that I used to perform this row operation. Now that I have an upper triangular matrix, I stop, and step one is done. For step two, I want to observe that because EA gave me U, E in general will be a product of elementary matrices. In this case, it was just one E that gave me EA equals U. This means that A can be written as E inverse U. And this E inverse is what's going to become our L. In fact, with sensible enough row operations, then I can assume that E inverse will be lower triangular. Uh, as long as I have been sensible in carrying out my row operations in a kind of downward and right way. And so what I'm going to see is that my A is going to be equal to LU, where my L is obtained from E inverse. So here, what was my E? It was 1, 0, minus 1, 1. So E inverse, I find, by changing the sign of the entry that's off the diagonal, using my shortcut rules for the inverses of elementary matrices. When you're dealing with elementary matrices, you do not need to trouble yourself with the entire algorithm where you start with something and then use Gaussian elimination to find the inverse. You can use the shortcut rules. And so what I have now for this very short example is that my original matrix A, 1, 2, 1, 0, is the product of E inverse, 1, 0, 1, 1, and U, which was the matrix 1, 2, 0, minus 2. These are the same matrices that we saw when I just jotted it down at the beginning of the exercise. Now, this example was very simple. There was only one row operation, therefore only one elementary matrix, and only one thing to invert. Most examples are going to be a bit more complicated than this one. So let's now look at a slightly more complicated example that will involve a couple of elementary matrices. So we're going to find an LU factorization of the 3 by 3 matrix A given here. So the first step is to transform A into an upper triangular matrix. 
and I have the three row operations that, were, that are going to be required already worked out. The first row operation is designed to take the pivot minus one and to use it to eliminate the two underneath it. So that row operation is two row one plus row two into row two. This changes the second row. After this, we multiply one third row two in order to turn this three into a one. And then the last row operation is to use the one that occurs in the middle of the matrix to eliminate the negative one underneath it. So that row operation would be row two plus row three into row three. Performing these three row operations will transform A into an upper triangular matrix that we're gonna call U. So let's now record all three of the elementary matrices that go with each of these steps. In the first case, our row operation was two row one plus row two. So when we jot down the elementary matrix that records this, the second row of this matrix is going to look different from an identity matrix. Two, one, zero, reflecting this exact linear combination right here. Everywhere else in this matrix looks like the identity. The second row operation would be recorded by the elementary matrix, which scalar multiplies the second row by one third. By the way, uh, it's common shorthand to leave, uh, to leave zeros out of a matrix when it's just down the diagonal like this. And then the third elementary matrix is going to carry out the row operation row two plus row three into row three. This was into row three, this was into row two, and the first one that we performed was into row two. Because our last row operation was into row three, this is, this is the row that's going to look most interesting in our elementary matrix. So here we should have a zero, one, and one, indicating the zero row one plus one row two plus one row three that's described by the row operation that we did. And the rest of our matrix looks like the identity. Okay, so we have the three elementary matrices that describe the three row operations that put A into upper triangular form. What I'm going to do right now is also write down the inverses of E1, E2, and E3, because I know I'm going to need that in a few minutes. So E1 inverse in blue, I can quickly calculate by just changing the sign of the two. Now I want to emphasize that usually you have to do a bit more work to find the inverse of a matrix. You don't just change signs in general. But when you have an elementary matrix, it's a special shortcut that you can use to write down the inverse of that matrix. So here, and really only here, is it okay to change the sign to get the inverse. For E2, the type of elementary matrix that it is is one that scalar multiplies a row, so its inverse will look like a 3 in that middle entry. And then the inverse of E3, we're going to obtain by changing the sign of the off diagonal entry. E3 was 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, so this becomes a 0, minus 1, 1. And those are the three inverses of the three elementary matrices. Now we're going to make the same observation that we made before. If you've worked through several of these examples, you won't necessarily have to write all of this down every time. But for, for, for the sake of explanation, I want to do this again. So the observation is that when we did all of these elementary row operations, we could multiply them together to get a matrix E. And if we left multiply that matrix E to A, which is written out long, E3 times E2 times E1 A, where we do this one first, we do this one second, and then we left multiply third by E3, because remember, we're multiplying on the left, that that gives us the matrix, uh, the parentheses should really be here, E times A, that gives us the matrix that we call U, which is upper triangular. And now all of these matrices are invertible. So A is now E inverse U. This is what you get by multiplying E inverse to both sides of the equation, E A equals U. And so A is E inverse U, and what E inverse is, is 
E3, E2, E1, that's E, inverted. But the rules for inverses tell you that if you distribute across the product, you have to reverse the order. So this is really E1 inverse, E2 inverse, E3 inverse multiplied times U. And it is this matrix, the product of the inverses in the reverse order that gives us L. This is our L. I will write it here in bold. L is E1 inverse, E2 inverse, E3 inverse. This is a bit more representative of what you will do in general because there's more than one step of row operations and more than one elementary matrix. So let's continue writing down our explicit L for this example. It looks like we're going to need a little bit more space on the page if we'd like to keep everything all in one view, which I believe is a good idea. So let's make this a bit smaller. So our specific L in this problem is E1 inverse, E2 inverse, E3 inverse given by the three inverse matrices that we calculated above, where we take the first inverse first and the second inverse second and the third inverse again. And then if you multiply these together, uh, we're going to multiply the, these two together first. This will give you the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, minus 1, 1. Then we multiply this product and that gives us a lower triangular matrix L. So this right here is our L. And now we have our matrix factorization. We can check, and I recommend in these problems that you always multiply it back out to make sure you get the matrix A. We should check that A is really equal to the LU that we say it is. Our L is this matrix. 1, 0, 0, minus 2, 1, 0, 0, no, is minus 2, 3, 0, 0, minus 1, 1. The matrix U that we found in the first step up here is minus 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2. And multiplying these two matrices together, checks out to give you the entries of our original matrix A. So minus 1, 2, 0, 2, minus 1, 0, and 0, minus 1, 2. And so it does work out. There's one small remark to make here. You'll notice in the row operations that we did, we did a combination of two rows, kind of moving downwards. We did a scalar multiple, and then we did another combination of two rows. And as we proceeded, we moved, we moved downwards in our row operations. We were clearing out entries underneath pivots. Something that we did not do is use row exchanges. So the caveat to point out here is that if you use row exchanges, the result may not be lower triangular. Part of what we're going for in this factorization is that the L that we produce after all this work is indeed lower triangular. So that, that requirement can put a little bit of a restriction on the row operations that you use. So the thing to keep in mind is that if you have a matrix that for some reason requires row operations in order for you to effectively put it into upper triangular form, the matrix that you're going to be factoring is not A, but rather PA. And it is PA that then would admit a factorization into LU. P here stands for permutation matrix, and it would be the product of the matrices that carries out the row exchanges that are required. I have worked up this exact same example, but involving a row, uh, a row exchange. It starts with the same matrix A and goes through the series of row operations, including a row exchange. This is going to be contained in the notes that accompany this video. And I encourage you to look through that example, which is very similar to this example, and observe that the matrix L that's produced after all these steps is not lower triangular.